What's good, good people? It's the Inspiration Vets. Let's talk episode four. Hey, before we start, I need you guys to subscribe to the channel. It's free. You know, it's free to, to click that like. Hey, man, we got a special guest on deck. Sergeant First Class Armando Thomas, man. 21 years, 21 and a half? 21 and a half. Two deployments, man. How does it feel to be out? Um, Like I can do whatever I want now. <laughs> do, you miss it? do you miss it at all? I miss people. Oh, That's great. about it. The camaraderie, huh? Yep. I, I miss the people. I miss my old soldiers. I miss, um, like, going to the range, stuff like that. But there's there's a lot that I don't miss. Right. He's one of the best NCOs that I had the privilege of serving up on. I learned a lot from him. And I appreciate you for bestowing some of that leadership upon me. Oh, man. That's, that's what I was there for. Okay. And I and I appreciate the shout out. Okay. Hey, okay, let's jump into it real quick. Like some of these questions you probably get a lot of. That's why I'm shooting it out to the public so they can probably get on this platform and just view things instead of just going straight into an office asking the questions. They might ask it anyway, but at the same time, you go to recruit somebody and they ask you, why should I join the service? What like what would you say to them? Well, first, I would do a little blueprinting on them and, and figure out what their needs are. Like, I joined because I was in high school, I had a child, and I knew that the Army would take care of me because I'm like a fifth-gen, sixth-gen soldier uh, from both sides of my family. All of us have served. And so I knew that I would, I would need to do that to take care of my family. Um, so I would I would get with the applicant and I would ask them what they need, what they plan to get out of the military. And I would counter that with what do they have to offer in the military? Because it's not just it's not just about what we can do for them. They got to be able to do something for themselves and they got to offer something to our team that we're welcome, welcoming them on. Right. That's big. I, I didn't think of it like that. What can you offer the military? It's kind of a, it's a two twofold being, huh? Yeah, it is. It is. Because, you know, we, a lot of, a lot of people, when you're in recruiting, you'll see that they look at it as like their last resort to join the military. Right. And it doesn't need to be like that. It doesn't need to be a last resort. Like it should be one of the, joining the military should be something that competes with any other uh, job application that you would do. And, and it offers so much more than just a job. It's like, it's a career. It will mold you and, and, and help you grow as a person. So we need people that have something to offer the military to come join. Okay. Okay, so what what is a recruiting process from beginning to the end? Okay, so like we, however we meet a person, whether they inquire about the military or we go out and find them and just ask them questions, yeah, there has to be an interest. Once that person is interested, They'll come in for an interview. You'll make the appointment with them. They'll come in for an interview, sit down with them and go through the process like you would a regular job. You just, um, you need like birth certificate, social security card, driver's license is preferred. And then we'll put you on a practice test. You take a practice test, which is prep for the ASVAB test. Um, and depending on how they score on the practice test determines whether we're going to send them down as soon as possible to take the actual ASVAB. Uh, once they pass the ASVAB, they have to do a physical. Uh, as long as they pass the physical with flying colors, they'll enlist. And before they do, before they do the enlistment, the physical and the enlistment process, the army allows you to pick your job before you go to METS. Unlike the other branches um so that's a plus for the army um you know you have to be you have to be physically fit it's at some point you have to have a clean uh medical background you have to have a clean legal background or you can't have tattoos on your face you know there, there's all kinds of things that disqualify people from joining and it's all choices that they make so like a lot of people that their values are in line with army values they won't come in with tattoos on their hands and on their face and on their neck and all that other stuff they'll come in and treat it like it's a job interview instead of coming in like sweatpants or you know t-shirts with 
with crazy print on them and, and curse words and derogatory terms and stuff like that. Like they know what we're looking for and we know what we're looking for, but the process itself is not that hard. Once you find a qualified applicant and then you have applicants that have issues, like some have legal issues or some have medical issues and the recruiter will apply for what's called a waiver. So you have a moral waiver or a medical waiver. And if it's something that can be waived, then we submit the paperwork for it and you move forward through the process of joining the army. So have you ever got anybody with like misdemeanors or felonies that you have to get a waiver for? So um, I actually, in my time in recruiting, so I started recruiting in 2008 and went all the way till 2021, March, 2021. And so I met a lot of people in recruiting and there were plenty of people that came in that, that um, had felonies and they needed waivers for them. Well, we don't waive felonies. Like they used to do stuff like that. They it used to be like a go to jail or, or, you know, join the army or go to jail. They don't have that kind of stuff anymore. Right. It's like, cause we want to, we want to clean up force, but um, misdemeanors. Yeah. I, I've, I've gotten a lot of waivers for misdemeanors. A lot of people have a lot of traffic tickets, traffic violations, a uh, little stuff like, like minor assault or theft or, you know, different things like that where they've been rehabilitated and we think they'd be a good candidate to join the army. So we submit the waiver for that. So I've, I've submitted countless waivers on, on applicants that really wanted to join. And then they showed that showed us that they wanted to serve. So you guys do like a, um, like a pre weigh and take before somebody can join the military. Yes, we do. Height and weight is a, is a big deal because we want a physically fit force. We want people to look good in their uniform. Uh, I mean, you know how it was height, weight and tape. Yeah. You know, like the, the army has a has a specified weight for your height and your age. And if you go over that, then they have to tape you. If you don't pass tape, you can be chaptered out of the military. Yeah. If you if you don't pass tape twice and they put you on all the programs that they're supposed to put on AR six six hundred dash nine. They go through that. Um, get you on remedial PT and everything, get you, get, take you to see a dietitian. So it's not like they just like let you be fat, and just let you go. There's, there's steps in this process. Uh, they'll take you to see a dietitian to make sure your diet's right and, and get you on track. Yeah, but it's up to the, the soldier to, to stay in those requirements. So what, what we do in the beginning when somebody's trying to join is we try to set them up for success. If they're overweight, we don't even process them until we can bring their weight down or they can pass tape. Um, it's, it's not that hard of a process. The only problem with the tape system is the fact that everybody tapes differently. So if one person can tape you and you can be under the right percentage and the next person can tape you and you can be over the percentage just based on how loose or how tight they put it around your neck and your waist. Um, but yeah, we, we like to have people that have the potential to be physically fit that we can work with and all that stuff. And, and and move them to the next level. Have you ever had anybody that passed that failed the, the tape when you gave it to them and you gave them like certain things to do and have they stuck through it? Like the diet and the workouts? That oh, you yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we've had plenty, we've had plenty of people. So the, the one of the goals in recruiting on the administrative side is to have a, um, a nutritionist, a nutritionist trained recruiter in every recruiting station. Right. Like they want to do that so that, so that they can they can give good advice because you're legally you're not allowed to to tell an applicant this is what you need to do this is how you need to diet this is what you need to eat so forth and so on because if something happens to them then we're liable for the advice that we gave them so we can point them in the right direction we can suggest broad categories and let them pick and choose from what they want to take from that. Um, but if, unless you're a nutritionist, there's, there's really no, um, guidance you can give them or a guidance that you're supposed to give them. But yeah, we've had plenty, I've had plenty of people who either didn't make weight or tape and we worked with them, uh, cause they can come do PT with us and everything like that. They just sign a waiver, uh, PT for everybody that doesn't know is physical fitness training. Um, so we do that. And then. 
other people I've had that have joined and they were at, they were right on the, on the cusp of being an overweight, but they made tape and heightened, heightened weight and tape, but they've, then they stop coming to functions. They stop coming to future soldier training. They stop doing the workouts and everything like that. And then they end up gaining weight while they're in the delayed entry program. And then we have to either do a renegotiation of a contract. Um, if that gets approved, we have to get their weight down. As long as they um, their weight is not higher than it was when they enlisted, when they did the first enlistment, uh, swearing, then they're good. But if, if they come to the second swearing when it's time to ship and they're over the weight that they enlisted at and they don't pass body fat, then there's a problem. Oh, wow. And that falls on that falls on the recruiter, that falls on the applicant, falls on everybody. The station commander, the first sergeant, the company commander, and it and it goes up. Oh wow. Because they want to know why you weren't tracking your future soldier to keep them within weight tolerances. I didn't know. I thought as soon as you signed on the dotted line, you was just good to go. Everything after that. No, man. And and really, they're going to basic training. They're going to get, um, they're going to get fit and acclimatized to um, military life and all that stuff and working out and and PT and all that. So I think somebody who, like, I don't exactly agree with the weight and tape because you know it's they're going to get in shape no matter who you are. When you go to basic, it's going to change your life. And so I think they should let some people that are overweight go as long as they can pass a PT test or the, um, the OPAT is what they give new future soldiers to get ready for the ACFT in the regular army. So as long as they can pass the OPAT for the specifications for the job that they pick, I think they should ship whether they're overweight or not, because they're at least physically fit enough to pass the test that they got to pass. So I think there should be some more leeway because people aren't built like they used to be when the standards were made and yeah. written. People aren't built like that anymore. I remember you, you had to get taped, right? Yeah. When you I, were in the army. I, uh, for the most part, I've always felt my weight. I always passed the tape though for, mm -hmm. for the most part, but I was always, yeah. I was always fit. Yeah, and you you were a big dude. You lift weights all the time and all that other stuff, and um, and you can you can not make the weight because because you got too much too much muscle, and you know, everybody knows muscle weighs more than fat. And right. so when we get the bodybuilder types that come in there that are physically fit but don't meet the army standards, that's a hard one to 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 tell somebody. It's like, no, we know you can do everything you need to do, but you don't meet the standards, so we can't enlist you. You know, that, that's crazy. All right. So um, I know you probably got a lot of individuals that's that's like die hard want to join the military and they don't know what like specific job to pick. In your opinion, what would you think is the best job for an individual to pick? I know it's like based on that person, but what mm -hmm. will set set a person up on the outside to be successful? So okay so every job mof that you pick in the army or military period will train you for leadership and will train you to be able to work as a team and stuff like that but specifically jobs that tend to help you more on the outside are your clerical jobs your um medical jobs the dentistry um computer system operators, uh, communications guys, cyber is big. So, you know, the, all the cyber threats and everything that we have, all that stuff is big. So if you get jobs in those fields, you're setting yourself up on the outside. Now, me personally, when I joined the army, I just wanted to blow stuff up and, and, and wreak havoc. Like, so I, I wasn't thinking about so much about what I was going to do when I got out because I knew that I, I had at least 20 years to figure out what I was going to be when I grow up. You know what I'm saying? So um, I, I love the combat jobs and everything like that, but those jobs do not set you up for everything that's out there. Like there, there's a lot more out there than blowing stuff up and shooting guns. And there's not too many jobs unless you're going to go into security or law enforcement or something like that 
or going into contracting where having a combat MOS is going to help you. But the leadership and the and the people moving and, and all that management, because leadership is a lot like management. The only thing is management, people listen to you because they have to listen to you. Right. With leadership, when you when you have true leadership, um, people want to listen to you. They want to do what you what you are telling them to do because you're providing motivation, purpose, and and they just they thrive off of that stuff if you're a good leader. That was big for me. That was that was real. We had the Napoleon types in there. That was real oh, big yeah. for me. <laughs> 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 they're everywhere they're yeah. everywhere man they're everywhere and you know there's 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 selfish people in the military just like you'll see um in every other facet of the world but they get weeded out pretty quickly real quick yeah yeah, yeah. so on on the school and tip you, you i know you get a lot of individuals coming in talking about hey is it possible for, for me to finish school while i'm in service or would you recommend that i delay or come inside like the, on the officer side like what do you talk to about to, with people that come in inquiring about the schools so what i tell them i always i would always use my recruiters and myself as an example because i was active duty the whole time i was in the army and before i retired i obtained i, I obtained an associate's degree and a bachelor's degree all on the army's dime like i, I did tuition assistance I didn't pay, I didn't use any of my GI bill and I didn't pay out of pocket at all because of tuition assistance, so $4,500 a year, uh, every fiscal year. So um, I use that. And so I tell people like, look, all of our, my recruiters, they're all working full time. They're, they have a job, they have families, they have all that other stuff and they still have time to go to school. You can do online school. Sometimes you can do brick and mortar school, like go to an actual university or whatever and go to school. Right. Um, but the easiest way is to do it online. And you just got to be able to balance your time and have a good time management. Um, and I tell, I tell people that want to come in and be officers, I'm just like, okay, well, let's see what your GPA is. Because becoming an officer in the military is, it's a very competitive process. And you know, also, the, you know, the kids that that didn't do too well in high school, you know, for whatever reason, they didn't do well in school. Um, I tell them, you know, like, do you really want to get, basically, it comes down to, are you going to go and waste your mom and dad's money by going to school when you're not even interested in going to school? Join the military, get some discipline under your belt and apply for school when you don't even have to pay for it. It's like, why give an extra bill to your parents when you can make your own way and take care of your, or secure your own future. So the people that want to come in and be officers, if they have a high GPA and they, because one, you have to have a bachelor's degree um, to come from the street and become an officer. Um, there's a green to gold program that you can do while you're in the army, or if you transfer from another branch to the army, you can do like blue to green, which is air force to army officer. Um, Marine Corps can do it. Navy can do it. Coast guard can do it. And they'll come in and, and enlist or commission under our officer program in the army. Um, but it's, it's like, they have to be, have drive, personal drive. They have to have done well in school, have that degree and everything. If you're just going to come off the street and become an officer, because officers are supposed to lead. Um, they're the figurehead. They really take care of a lot of admin stuff and everything like that and plan a bunch of crap for the soldiers to do. But um, they need to be able to have some kind of leadership in their bones. Right. And you, you learn leadership you hone your you hone your skills of leadership as you go but people are born with leadership like if you are if you have no leadership and you can't you're not willing to learn or grow then you'll never be you'll never be the, the person that needs to be leading troops as an nco or an officer but like the taking care of the problem training um doing a doing uh, submitting awards all that other stuff that's nco business 
making sure the pay is good for your soldiers. That's NCO business. The logistics and the and the okay, we're going to go do this field problem, so forth and so on. That's all officer side. So you you got to you need to be intelligent. But there's another thing that there's a there's a um, stigma in the military or from civilians that think that enlisted soldiers aren't smart. So back in the day, you had to have college. You had to be a thinking man to, be, to join the military and get promoted and all that other stuff. And being an officer, the reason why they got paid so much more than enlisted people was because they were supposed to be smart. They had degrees, all this other stuff, and they went to a bunch of school. Well, nowadays, you have privates that have as much education as officers have. Like, you have you have sergeants, E5s, E6s, E7s. They all have master's degrees, bachelor's degrees, doing all this other stuff. So they have the same qualifications as the officers do, which is another reason why they need to change the pay, the gap in the pay. But anyway, that's a whole another whole another subject. Right. Um, but the officers got a job to do, and enlisted got a job to do, and they have to work together to make the mission complete. Right. So, so since you're already out. Like this is a question for the people that's trying to get out. What would you say? This is the last question. What would you say to an individual that's transition, transitioning out of the military, like to better prepare them? So I would tell them, regardless of what anybody says to them or how they try to make you feel or whatever, because there's also a stigma around going to sit call and taking care of yourself. The mission comes first, blah, 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 blah. They always say all that stuff. But what can you do if you're broke and not taking care of yourself? You're not gonna give 100% to the mission. So you need to take care of yourself. You need to go to the doctor. You need to get your injuries and your ailments documented so you have records of everything. And when you're on, in the process of getting out, you can either wait till you're all the way out and start your VA process, or you can start it like, six months before you're supposed to ETS or retire. If you do it before you ETS or retire, it makes every, the process goes a lot smoother and it's a lot quicker. And that's how you get like your 100% disability or something like that. You need to take care of yourself because the army, while they have good intentions for you, their most important, their most important, um, I don't even know what I'm trying to say. Like they're, they, they want the mission complete. That's the most important thing to them. And so they are not going to make sure that you take care of yourself unless they're good leaders and yeah, everybody can be a good leader. So you have to take care of yourself. You got to get your paperwork, got to go to the doctor, all that stuff, get everything documented, get your school done, use that tuition assistance, make sure. And tuition assistance isn't only for college. You can get certifications, you can go to, like, you can become a licensed mechanic, like all kinds of stuff. You can go to um, cosmetology, like as long as it's an accredited school, you can go do that or an accredited trade. You can use the GI Bill and tuition assistance to complete that stuff. So while you're getting this free education or why the free education is offered to you, I and mean, we all know it's not free because you got blood, sweat and tears that you're, you're putting in to get this, right. but the education is there at no extra cost, monetary cost to you. So you need to do it. Get you get as much school and certifications as you can get and take care of your health. That's what I would tell anybody who's who is coming to the end of their um, enlistment contract. OK, man. Hey, I appreciate you for your time, man. I know you're going out your way to do some things that you don't have to do. So I, I, I really appreciate that. Hey, man, you guys heard it first. The process is always hard, but it's the end game is always the best. Hey, so I'm first class checking out. Fall in. Who's next?